the talk today, I'm going to basically um, take you through the journey of how we, you know, explain a bit about who is we, uh, went into GraphQL um, from the start till where we are now today. So who, who is we? Um, so I'm a member of a group called the Guild. Uh, today we're the largest open source group in the GraphQL world. Um, we build, if you're using GraphQL, you're probably using at least one of our tools. Um, some famous tools uh, that you might have heard of are the GraphQL code generator, where you can generate from GraphQL schemas and operations, you can generate uh, types for the backend and for the frontend. Um, GraphQL inspector, where you could basically validate the, your changes to the GraphQL schema and make sure you're not breaking, making any breaking changes. Um, GraphQL modules that helps you scale uh, your GraphQL gateways between different teams, across different teams, and give them different responsibilities. Uh, and GraphQL tools, which I'll mention a bit about in this talk later. And GraphQL mesh, which I'll also mention about. Um, the important thing here, wait, there's like a weird thing here. Uh, the, the reason we build all those different tools is because we saw there's a need and also we have this vision where you could use GraphQL to change a lot of different parts of your stack. But in, with most of the clients that we work with, which are, which are very large companies, you can't just go about changing everything and coming up with one framework that fits all. So we thought that the idea of just building small packages that, in, where you could gradually integrate into specific places uh, is a better approach. Um, also, we're a member of the GraphQL Foundation, which um, um, basically it's uh, under the Linux Foundation, and we support all the main um, projects around GraphQL, like uh, the GraphQL.org, um, and many other new projects that um, I'll just mention a bit here, like there's a new WebSocket library, um, the defer and stream directive, the live directive, so you can have live queries over GraphQL. Uh, if you have questions, it's more advanced subject, but if you have more questions about that, I would love to answer. So as for the actual talk, um, so as we've been through basically everything you can go through with GraphQL with many, many companies. So the goal today for me is to take you through our master plan, like how we are thinking and going about integrating GraphQL. Um, and with the hopes that you could look at it and um, maybe use it when you're trying to think about GraphQL, because I think there's a lot of um, tools that people are, are don't know, and there's a lot of applications that for GraphQL that people haven't heard of. And also there's all kinds of misconceptions of, around GraphQL. Um, so I think maybe this less traditional uh, point of view of GraphQL might help you. Um, so let's go back to the basics. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is basically a query language, query language over data. Um, you can take, you can query any data. Uh, you need to describe the data in a schema. But that data can be anything, a file, a remote API, it can originate from a database, um, in memory, anything, by, uh, and all of those combined. And then by, by describing that schema, um, consumers can query that data um, with queries. And they have a guarantee to get the response in the shape that they want and exactly how they want it to be with the types and everything. So this is a could be a very powerful tool for anything that consumes data everywhere. Um, so let's look a bit about how it works and then um, um, and then dive deeper. So um, let's say we have a, a data source. Let's say it's a server, an existing server. And that server has a user type and a message type. Um, and the user has a list of messages, a number of messages. So now the client can actually query for, let's say, user ID and the user's name. The client will send a request. The GraphQL engine, which you see in the middle, will execute that uh, request, um, go and fetch the user, fetch the user's name, and then send it back. Um, and the results will be exactly as the client would expect. Now let's look, uh, what if the user queries for name and messages? So again, if the, user, the, the, the consumer, the client, will send one uh, single request. Um, then the GraphQL engine will fetch the user, 
in parallel, it will fetch the messages and the name. And then maybe the content will actually come from a third party API, like a CMS or something like that. The client doesn't know. The client will get single response with everything it expected in the shape that it expected to get. And usually that, that uh, request is over the network. That's a classical GraphQL use case. So that means that over the network, we send less data uh, and we send many, much less, many less requests. So the performance could be much better. Um, so usually those are the main benefits that people talk about when they talk about GraphQL, but I think there's more. So I want to dive a bit deeper about how it works under the hood. Um, so by describing the schema, what we do, we describe an executable schema. It means that we have the schema that you see here, but also we need for each, um, uh, for each field on a type, let's say the name uh, uh, field, um, we need to basically build a function. How to get that name from a, a to get the name? And a function basically has a a known uh, inputs, so it means like parts of the query and the parent value of the and all kinds of things like that. Then that function needs to do something. It can do anything, maybe call a server, and it needs to return a string that is specified by the schema. So this is, by the way, um, a very nice way to distribute tasks between programmers or for your own. It's just a very nice way to organize the code. Now, what I'm going to show you here in this slide is basically what is GraphQL. Is the, let's, I think about GraphQL as just a simple function. So that function, if we send it those boxes and schema that we just seen, and we send it a query, everything that's going to be happening in this slide is going to be happening uh, automatically by GraphQL. So while I'm going through the slide, I hope you can think about where do you use and you write that code today. Um, so by sending the get user, so first of all, GraphQL will get the first resolver, the get user resolver, send it the ID 10 and return um, in a user object. Now GraphQL will go and fetch the two boxes, um, name and messages, and will execute them in parallel uh, because it can. And then when the name uh, is ready, it's just a scalar value, so it put this in place, but then messages, you'll get three different messages. And for each message, GraphQL will execute the title and the date resolver. And we'll do it all in parallel um, because it can. So all that work is being done automatically for you by GraphQL. It's no longer a code that you need to write. Um, it's a safer code. So you know the benefits we talked about, like network performance, also, a schema of data graph, like it makes you actually describe all your different data sources in one single language, which makes a lot of order uh, in code bases and in companies. Um, basically, orchestration and automation out of the box. So you don't need to write all that code to fetch multiple things, uh, some of them in parallel, some of them are not, then um, mesh that data together to put it into the way that the client needs to display to the user. All of that can be done automatically. Uh, and also part of that um, order means that now you can create relations between relationships between um, different teams or different data sources um, and, and, and clients can just automatically query uh, as if those relations were the same source. So those are some of the benefits of GraphQL and what you can see is that you could use this in many, many different cases. Like you can think I can maybe use it on a client, I can maybe use it between the client and the server, maybe between server and server, or service and service. So when we go into a company and we, and we want to introduce GraphQL, we first ask ourselves, well, where is that logic sits today? Let's start with something that you're already doing and let's just automate this as a first small part to make it successful. So um, usually, uh, there's many different answers for it, but usually the answer is actually on the client. So usually what people, what uh, a lot of applications have, they have a client. This client talks with REST APIs to the server or different servers, fetch all the data, and then merges all the data, waits for or an orchestrate basically, waits for all the data to arrive, then iterate over the data and kind of like um, design it in a way that uh, is ready to render for the UI and then renders the UI. And there's a lot of code on the client for that. 
So what we usually start doing is actually we're taking all that code, we're taking GraphQL, and we just automate that process on the client. So all those. So first of all, it saves a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, lines of code, uh, and it clears a lot of bugs and makes a lot of order. Uh, but then also, when you once you finished with that phase, when and by the way, many companies just stay in that phase, and we have a lot of clients that are really really big. Some of them I can mention, and some of them are, are not. Like one example is Microsoft, where GraphQL is just working on the client. Um, so, um, uh, but then let's say you, so, so this is already gives you a lot of benefits, even though it's not the classical use case that people are talking about. But at this point, once, once you did that, uh, you can actually, at any point in time, if you want to move it to the server and you want to get extra benefits and the trade trade-offs make sense for you, you can take all that code that you build on the client and, uh, move it to the server. There's a whole um, lecture that I gave at GoTo, uh, previous GoTo's, about just this area, how you can start using GraphQL on the client and then gradually move to the backend if you want. Um, now, GraphQL gives us all kinds of other benefits. Uh, I'm going to skip this part a bit because I, I want to get into something. But So let's say GraphQL is great. We got into the point where we um, now have it on the client. We get the benefits. Maybe even we moved it to the gateway and we got also the performance benefits. But most importantly, we got the developer experience benefits. Like we got the type safety. We got all the toolings around it. Um, auto completion between API on APIs. Like tools that um, it's kind of like once you're starting to use GraphQL, it's kind of mind blowing and it's really a productivity booster. That's like, in my opinion, the biggest benefits of GraphQL. So once we've done that, the natural question that people come up with is, well, could we get all those benefits on our existing services, like on the backend? Um, and, you know, and many times uh, enthusiasts are just saying, yeah, let's just do everything GraphQL. Let's just rewrite all of our servers into GraphQL. Um, it's the best thing ever. Um, let's go do it. And that's okay. I mean, there's some benefits in, in that as well. And there's a whole talk I gave also in previous go-tos about um, if GraphQL is good for the backend or not. Um, but, um, but the truth is, is that even if it was good for certain scenarios, it might be, um, it, it's basically, um, how do I say it? it, it it's not realistic um, because uh, you have so many existing services, so many existing teams, um, and um, and they, they are not going to just buy in into this new technology. And also they have enough things to do anyway. Or maybe it's legacy services and you're not going to touch them anyway. So. Even though it might be a good option, it's not necessarily the realistic one. But still, um, when we come into company companies, we try to see if we can get those benefits at least um, in a way that it makes sense. And the interesting thing is that those services they're there exist, they're existing, and sometimes they have schemas. And even if they don't have schemas, they're working. So you can look at the data and you can analyze data, the data, and basically create schemas. So what we thought was, well, what if we could take those existing services, take the data from them, analyze them, and automatically, without asking them to do anything, generate GraphQL schemas. So now we can take um, each existing service out there, and without them doing anything, any, any work at all, uh, we could query them as if they were GraphQL. So that's that tool that we tried to build a couple of years ago, and it worked, is GraphQL Mesh. Uh, so I'll mention a bit about it. So GraphQL Mesh is basically this tool that I described, which can take any, almost any data source. Um, you can see here just a number of them, like OpenAPI and Swagger, gRPC, SOAP, um, SQL databases, old data. With old data, we worked with Microsoft on it, on the MS Data Graph. Um, take those sources and automatically convert them into GraphQL. Um, so what you can start doing then is then, even though those sources, they don't even know that you're querying GraphQL, they don't know what even GraphQL is, 
the clients can start querying those sources as if they were GraphQL. And this is already very, very powerful. You can get as the consumer, you can get all the benefits from GraphQL without asking your providers to adhere to GraphQL. So this is a very powerful uh, idea and a very powerful thing. Um, but then we thought, well, with the concept of GraphQL, we can take all those different sources that we just um, converted into GraphQL and merge them into one single data graph. Um, and merging different GraphQL sources, there's basically two um, options here. One is uh, um, one option or one strategy called a portal federation, and the other one is called schema stitching. Um, and there's a lot to talk about those two. The most important thing to just mention here is that with GraphQL Mesh, you don't need to choose. You can, uh, or we, we, let, we give you the choice. So you can choose between Apollo Federation and schema stitching from GraphQL tools. I'll just mention that if you heard in the past the schema stitching was deprecated in favor of Apollo Federation, that that's not true. We took over the library, we completely rebuilt it, and we think actually um, it has today a lot of benefits over Apollo Federation. Um, um, some of those benefits are just that you can see here in the code a bit, but the basic idea is that it's just GraphQL. You can basically get all the benefits that you get from Apollo Federation without moving to a different or to a different spec or a different ecosystem. Like you're staying with the GraphQL ecosystem, you can use all the existing tools, um, but still get this federated schema happening. So if you in the past used schema stitching and you thought it was deprecated or you moved to federation because that was the only option, I really think you should check out and learn a bit about um, schema stitching again. Um, yeah, so, um, so the idea of GraphQL Mesh again is that we can take all those different sources without asking them to do anything and get the benefits of GraphQL. So now we can use it in many, many different places. Now, where are those many different places? Maybe now we can take GraphQL Mesh and generate a gateway, like a central point where all the services or all the clients will call to, and then the, where the request will be distributed to the, to the, to the different um, APIs and the different services, which is good. But um, we could also, what we could do, which I think is extremely powerful, is we could take all, all this data, all this metadata around uh, those services, um, all the things we know and generated from those different services and generate SDKs that can run anywhere distributedly. So now not only that GraphQL Mesh can be um, a gateway or a central point of um, central point where everything comes to, which is also means a central point of failure, but it can also just run as an SDK on your existing services. So if you have a data service that just queries all kinds of different um, services in order to generate something or to give some reports or something like that, um, you can make their work much easier. And again, without needing them to add something central, you could just have an SDK and call everyone as in the same architecture as they call today, but still the, the experience will feel like they're calling a full distributed a full uh, graph. I'm going to skip this part um, and I hope to get into questions soon, but there's just one thing that I want to mention. How is all of that possible? So basically the last part where I can take this, all this metadata, but then run it and execute it anywhere or as a gateway or as a, or as a um, SDK. And the, the reason like, we can do that is basically that we need a way to store all that metadata that is not directly connected to how we execute it. And for that, we need a registry. Um, and what we are building right now at the Guild is basically a product called GraphQL Hive. Uh, that is just simply a very powerful registry. Like because of GraphQL, we can create, we can have a registry, but with very strong capabilities because of the knowledge and because of the way GraphQL works. But the most interesting thing here is that, um, for, by the way, this is open source, so you can just try it and use it. Um, but uh, the most interesting thing here is because of the abilities of GraphQL Mesh to convert different sources into GraphQL, um, 
you don't need actually to work with GraphQL in order to get all those benefits. Um, and the really weird thing we started seeing recently is that people started using uh, GraphQL Hive, even though at runtime, they don't use GraphQL at all. It was just the easiest language and the easiest interface to look at all the different data across all the different, all, all the different services around the company and have one unified view and have all kinds of developer tools on it. Um, um, it, it, it all kinds of developer tools on it, even though um, the actual services are not GraphQL. So this was very, very exciting. So when I said at the beginning that I will talk about all kinds of use cases that you know you might not think GraphQL is part of, then um, that's uh, something that really blew our minds and we're really happy about. Thank you.